James writes, I am just like Sean in a zombie apocalypse in that there is absolutely no chance I'm hitting anything with my gun, even when my life literally depended on it. I'd probably be the first to die in a zombie apocalypse. I think I would be absolutely useless at hitting anything, so I'm with you there, James. Hey, I'm Edgar Wright, and we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of Shaun of the Dead by reading some letterbox reviews. Okay, here goes. Megs writes, The way Simon slips when there's nothing on the floor, impeccable acting. Well, I'm not going to give anything away, but you should watch the new version because there might be a little Easter egg. Not quite like the Star Wars Special Edition, but there might be something in there for you for that very moment. So please enjoy. When we shot the scene where he walked to the store and back, me and Simon went down to the location and did a rehearsal on video because the director of photography, David Dunlap, said this scene's going to be cut out. And I was like, wait, what do you mean? He goes, this is shoe leather. You're never going to use this scene of him walking to the shops and back. And I must admit, I was so mad that he suggested that. I thought, okay, whatever gags we've got in there, we should triple them. So him slipping on the blood was in the script for sure. But other things like him tripping on the curb, you know, we basically rehearsed it so that basically the shot would be so cool it couldn't be cut out. Alex Todd writes, an absolute national treasure. It almost makes me proud to be British. I will say the one of my proudest things about Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz and The World's End was that the film traveled around the world and as a British filmmaker seeing like the UK on the big screen in other countries was totally surreal so to be in Hollywood and watching Crouch End or Enfield or Highgate up on the big screen was really wild to be in the Cinerama Dome you know on Sunset Boulevard and see North London on the big screen a really surreal and amazing experience and one that I'll forever cherish Lucy writes my girlfriend to me watching the last 20 minutes of Shaun of the Dead you've got tears on you I must admit actually I had to watch it the other day for the remastering and the mum scene really got me and I co-wrote the movie and directed that scene but for some reason watching it again 20 years later the mum scene with Penelope Wilson I'm not going to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it really devastated me so I, I agree with you Lucy Wright and Peg intentionally parodied Kill Bill with the Kill Phil sequence in the same year Kill Bill was produced explain this atheists well it's an easy explanation I think Kill Bill Volume 1 came out in 2003 and we were shooting the film in 2003. Now, I don't think I saw Kill Bill until we were editing. I went to the Kill Bill premiere in London. It must have been around September. And we were definitely editing the movie. But obviously the trailers were out or we were aware that it was coming. So we definitely knew the title. So that's how we're like the Nostradamus is there. Yaz writes, let it be known that I would rather become a zombie than destroy an original vinyl pressing of Blue Monday. What, 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 what was that? Um, I think it was Blue Monday. I agree with that, Yaz. Addy Cohen writes, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are the best thing to happen to Britain since Princess Diana. I guess Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are also the people's princesses. Levi writes, the most unrealistic part about this wasn't the zombie apocalypse, but the idea that the British government would react so quickly to a crisis. I think that's fair. Like, they, they do, like, wrap it up in about 24 hours, so... Yeah, I would agree with that too. Lauren writes, Sean having self-esteem issues and self-doubt instead of fighting zombies in the middle of a zombie attack is peak relatability. Really, the movie is about like a quarter life crisis. It's really about Sean turning 30 and having to sort of deal with being a responsible adult. So we always like wrote the film to be almost like a relationship drama or a rom-com that just happens to have zombies in it. So I think you're absolutely dead on there. Russ Fisher writes, just when I think I could never feel early 2000s nostalgia, I rewatched this. Next thing, I'm wearing cargo pants and a messenger bag and I've thrown my iPhone in the river. It's funny, it's very strange for me because on one hand it does feel like 20 years ago and it also feels like we made the film yesterday. I feel sort of nostalgic about it and I don't at the same time and I've never worn cargo pants so I can't actually um, even... Um, relate to that at all sorry andrea writes according to imdb nick frost allegedly kept his genitals shaved throughout the production to create a genuine need to scratch that the character demanded and for that alone this movie deserves all the stars that is true i didn't tell nick to do that he decided to do that himself 
but that is true. You also notice that he's got like a chunk of his hair missing. That was sort of inspired by Jackass, the idea of the Phantom Clippers, of people coming in that he was drunk and somebody else had clipped off a part of his hair whilst he was passed out. So that's why he has a big patch of hair missing in the back. Joe Lynch writes, a total masterpiece, the movie we all wish we made. Best whip pans in a film? Possibly. I think that must be the director, Joe Lynch. If, if so, thank you very much. I appreciate it. David Dunlap, who was the DOP and also the operator, was also the camera operator on Goodfellas. And I remember there's one whip pan that he did onto the mug. To do a whip pan onto a close-up is quite difficult and he was lining up with it. And I remember me and the AD were standing behind the monitor. He did the whip pan onto Sean's mug and we went, ooh. And he shouted for the other and he goes, guys, I can't do this if you're going to laugh. And I said, we weren't laughing. We were just exclaiming how cool it was. So I would agree. Really good whip pans and well done, David Dunlap. True rights. Can dogs look up though? This is something that came from Nick Frost. Nick Frost used to have this um, theory that dogs can't look up. Yeah, well, Big Al also says dogs can't look up. I don't think that's accurate. I don't think they can look fully, fully up like that. Or maybe they can. Even in just doing it, I thought maybe they can look up. But it's a good thing to make you think. Lucia writes, Freddie Mercury once said, you can do what you want with my music, but don't make me boring. I think it's safe to say that a scene where a group of Brits, led by Simon Pegg, beat a zombie to death to the beat of Don't Stop Me Now is exactly what he had in mind. Thank you. I am a big Queen fan. It's funny, back in 2004, Don't Stop Me Now wasn't one of Queen's most famous songs. It isn't even really in the Queen musical, which I was sort of baffled by. And as a Queen fan, I always thought that was one of the sort of happiest songs they had and felt like a big Broadway show tune. So when we were writing the script and we were thinking of the idea of what's the most incongruous song and the happiest song you can have on the jukebox during a zombie apocalypse. My, my vote was for Don't Stop Me Now. And weirdly, the reason that You're My Best Friend ends up in the end credits is because on Queen's Greatest Hits, which we had on CD and we were playing in the writing office, You're My Best Friend comes after Don't Stop Me Now. So obviously we'd listen to Don't Stop Me Now a lot because we were writing the script. And then every time You're My Best Friend would start up and the first lyric was, Ooh, you're making me live. I'd be like, this should be the end credit song. So that's how that came about. So thank you, Queen, and thank you, Freddie. No matter how many times I watch this, I will always find the dozens of setups and payoffs in the screenplay incredibly satisfying. Thank you, Nick. Uh, we did work really hard on that, and we were inspired by a lot of screenplays that have a lot of setups and payoffs. Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale are amazing at that, particularly in Back to the Future. The Coen Brothers, Raising Arizona script, has a lot of setups and payoffs. Payoffs. So those are two off the top of my head that I think really inspired us. When we were making Space, the TV show on Channel 4 before that, we were always really impressed by how much detail viewers would absorb and obsess over. So we knew that like everything that we put in there would pay off. But we really like worked hard on that three-act structure and usually it was a thing of having two repetitions of something. You've got red on you. You've got red on you. And then the third version, it would be a subversion of it. So those displayed by their you. attackers, if you know. Yeah, we really enjoyed doing that and continue to do it in Hot Fuzz and the World's End too. So thank you, Nick. Mike Jin, or Mike Gin, I guess I Mike Jin. Why isn't it spelled Sean? S-H-A-W-N. Uh, that is a very good question. I think we went with S H A U N because of Sean Ryder from the Happy Mondays. I think that was the Sean that we were going for instead of um, Sean Levy or Sean Wayans. I guess that maybe Sean with a W was a bit more of an American spelling. The other one that we definitely didn't go for was um, S E A N. When I was a kid, I was very confused by the spelling of Sean Connery. It always felt like it was like Scene Connery. Like that doesn't make any sense. When it came out in 2004 in the UK it only came out two weeks after Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead so in some cinemas you'd go to the multiplex and on the same like digital display it would say Dawn of the Dead and Shaun of the Dead and then I was like oh it's a girl's name Dawn and it's a guy's name Shaun get tickets today to relive Shaun of the Dead on the big screen beginning August 30th